Hello, and welcome back to Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and today I wanted to take you through a game from the World Rapid Championship, although this time it's from the women's section. Uh, the game was between uh, Humpy Kuneru and Nana Zig Zignidzi. Tough name. Uh, so I'll be calling her Nana. These two players will actually be playing here in St. Louis very, very soon uh, for the Cairns Cup. Uh, and so it's interesting to see how they squared off in this game at the Rapid Championship. Uh, Kuneru had white, and she chose d4 after e6, c4, knight f6, knight c3, bishop b4. We are once again in a Nimzo Indian. Uh, white chose e3 uh, as the line after castles. White has a lot of options here. Um, you can develop the, the bishop, you can develop the knight this way. Or you can play knight e2. And this is a pretty interesting try. Uh, part of the, the reason the Nimzo Indian is played is when the bishop captures this knight on c3, black is hoping to slightly fracture white's pawn structure in a lot of lines. By bringing this knight to e2 uh, so early, you are saying that you're not going to fracture your pawn structure, that you're going to recapture with the knight, and black will have nothing in exchange for giving up the bishop. Uh, with that in mind, uh, black plays d5. And after a3, the point of white's play, black usually does not capture this uh, this knight, instead choosing to retreat the bishop to either e7 or d6. And the choice between these two is, is rather interesting. By coming to e7, uh, white will probably, most likely, just take on d5 and play knight f4. And it will be a very, very, uh, you know, natural game. You have this classic Carlsbad structure, and white will play like, like it's a Queen's Gambit declined type type structure. You're kind of transposing into a QGD type of game. That in mind, though, you might notice that the bishop has another option from d7, and that's to come to d6. And this is a try at an improved version of the other line. If white plays the same way, with c takes d5 and e takes d5, now this knight probably doesn't want to come to f4. It can come to g3. And this bishop is much better placed on d6 than e7. It's out of the way on the e-file for the rook, and this would be a much, much better version for black. So in the game, this is what black chose to do. Black chose to put this bishop on d6, aiming for that improved version. However, as always in chess, there's usually a downside to things. And the downside to bishop d6 is it's daring white to take more space on the queen's side. And that is done via this move, c5. Now c5 comes with tempo on the bishop on d6, whereas if the bishop were on e7, c5 is much less attractive because the, the, pawn, uh, the pawn move would be wasting a tempo. You wouldn't be gaining time on the bishop. Now this bishop does come back to e7, but white has committed to c5. Uh, black is going to try to prove that this is a bad thing, and meanwhile white is going to try to prove that the space advantage is quite useful. The natural follow-up for white is b4, supporting this pawn further. <clears throat> we now see c6 from black, knight f4, a5, trying to break down this structure. Uh, this bishop comes to b2. It's necessary to defend this rook, otherwise a takes b4 would be winning. And now b6 creates even more tension on this queen's side between uh, all of these pawns locked on dark squares. At this point, white develops uh, her final piece with bishop e2, and black plays an idea we've all seen before, Bishop a6. This is a good bishop for white, this is a bad bishop for black, so black aims to trade it off. White simply castles here. Uh, black develops with knight bd7. Uh, Canero takes on a6, rook takes a6, queen e2, queen a8, knight d3. And now you kind of see the, the character of the position. Uh, black is hoping to open up some of these lines on the queen's side, aiming to bring her major pieces over and uh, open these lines, find counterplay against what these, pawn, these pawns, which might be called overextended. Meanwhile, white is supporting these pawns with her pieces from behind, and will be looking to open things up not on the queen's side, but rather in the center, with moves like f3 and e4. And if white does achieve this, Look to, she'll look to open this long diagonal and then transfer her pieces to attack the, the king's side. Uh, and this is a very, very dangerous game. Games like this, where both sides are playing on uh, different sides of the board, can go wrong quite quickly. And, and we'll see what happened here. So simply rook b8 from black is, is a natural move. Like I said, you want to open up lines. 
Uh, white takes the time to play rook fb1, supporting these pawns further. And now rook a7 was the slightly strange choice from black. Uh, I'm not sure what, what the idea uh, entirely was here. She's delaying opening up the, the queen side for just a bit, not yet showing her hand. However, white wastes no time. White continues with f3. And after h6, I guess creating luft for the king, but allowing white to kind of uh, break through uncontested with this move e4. And already, you know, I would start getting a little bit nervous with, with black here, seeing this, this central majority, well not majority, just these central pawns coming through, coming down towards, towards my pieces. It can be slightly scary. Uh, black chose pawn takes e4. White responds with pawn takes e4. And now, uh, Nana decided this was the correct moment to open things up on the queen side. And that she did. Uh, with both of these pawn captures, now the black major pieces are entirely revealed, and these open files are, are going to be where the, the combat is, is taking place. White continues actually, uh, well, black continues actually with e5. And this move uh, is actually not, not the greatest. Uh, it puts this pawn on a square where it can actually kind of be targeted by, uh, by the, the white bishop. And in addition to that, this space advantage on the queen side is going to be very, very uncomfortable, unless black does something about it uh, almost immediately. And so my question to you viewers is, can you find an interesting line, perhaps a sacrifice, to really break down this, this structure of the pawns? It's a very unique, well, not unique idea, it's a very interesting idea, and one that would have, would have been uh, quite nice for black here, to just totally equalize and get rid of this, these annoying pawns that are cramping her position. Okay, hopefully you're able to find it. And the idea is rook takes b4, sacrificing an exchange. Uh, at first glance, it looks like an, an entire rook is being sacrificed, but of course, there is this nice fork uh, with bishop takes c5. The king would have to move, and after bishop takes b4, the material count is three pawns to five, and white has an exchange for those two pawns. So this position is actually uh, a pretty nice pretty nice for black. It, black doesn't have an advantage, but black certainly isn't worse here. The c pawn will be quite useful. It is passed, but our white will have to keep an eye on it, and the black pieces are all going to be in the game now that these annoying b4 and c5 pawns are out of the way. Game might, the game might continue with something like e5, bishop takes c3, bishop takes c3, and knight d5. You see this knight has a very nice outpost, and uh, this knight can also contribute to the game either from d7 or a square like g6, where it looks at squares like f4. That being said, e5 for black misses this opportunity, and now uh, white's advantage is going to start being felt, that, that advantage in space. Knight d1 was white's choice, immediately pressuring this pawn. Rook a2 temporarily defends the pawn by pinning the bishop to the queen. We now see the knight come back to c3, uh, forcing the rook to move again. Uh, black had the option to just repeat, but instead we see rook takes a1, rook takes a1, and queen b7. Uh, white plays the same idea, knight back to d1, putting pressure on e5. And now, uh, black plays queen b5. And already, this is just a, a very, very tough position for, for black. Uh, these pieces are all being hampered by white's advantage in, in space. And that advantage is not going anywhere now that black has missed this opportunity to, to capture on b4, sacrificing. In fact, I don't want to go into the line too much, but after knight d3, this was really, or knight e3 rather, this was black's last opportunity to get back into the game. And it's with a very unorthodox peace sacrifice, simply knight takes c5. You give up this knight for a pawn, and then there's a lot of pressure on the slightly misplaced white pieces. I don't want to go into this line too much because it's very, very complicated and I don't fully understand it, but uh, this is what the engine gives as, as being equal. Instead, though, she played a very human move, rook d8, with some similar ideas of sacrificing. But after rook a5, there's no such luck. This queen has to move, and there's no more pressure on the d3 knight. This knight now comes to c4. We see knight f8. We see bishop takes e5. And with the e-pawn falling, uh, this is really spelling disaster for black. 
knight e6, bishop d6, bishop f8, h3, knight g5, and now after e5, white has cemented this bishop onto the d6 square. At any point, white can trade these bishops and bring this knight into an even better outpost. And we'll see just that happen pretty quickly here. Knight d5, queen e1, helps defend this pawn. Queen d7, this queen now comes to f2, the threat to the pawn being removed. We see queen e6, and at this point, white does choose to snap off this bishop and play knight d6. Uh, now queen g6 comes through, queen g3, and it looks like black is actually finding some counterplay here, but uh, maybe a move like f5 was, was a missed opportunity. Uh, this knight can come back to f2, but after f4, this queen's going to be in some trouble. And after this queen has to move, let's say, queen d3, black is really getting a nice attack on, on the king's side here. So a move like f3 is going to come, and black is actually playing for an advantage all of a sudden. So let's back up and see exactly how that happens. Uh, this queen g6 move is actually very, very tricky. It's putting a lot of pressure onto the white king. It's threatening knight takes h3 as well. And the only move for white to maintain an edge here was actually queen f5. Uh, queen f5 offering the trade of queens, keeping an eye on this h3 square, uh, and this would maintain the edge of the extra pawn. Unfortunately for white, queen g3 doesn't do that. As we looked, f5 would be a very, very interesting way to, to gain an edge. White could also try and, and trade, but with all of this pressure around the white king, uh, black is going to have a very nice attack. That being said, f5 was missed for black, and in fact, knight takes b4 was her choice. Uh, while this is equalizing and regaining the pawn, it's, it's kind of a missed opportunity to, to go for this nice attack with f5. Of course, if knight takes b4, the idea is queen b1 check, regaining the knight. So instead of knight b4, white instead chooses knight f4. Queen b1 check, king h2. And now uh, black's equality was actually short-lived, as now it is black's king that comes under fire. You see a very similar setup where, where the white queen is now aimed at g7, and black needed to realize the danger here, because if you do uh, some nonchalant move, which is what was played, so move, not really sensing the danger. This move h4 is very, very tough to, to deal with. The knight comes back to h7, and all of a sudden, you're getting checkmated. <laughs> uh, it's very, very difficult to stop this threat of queen g7. In fact, g6 or g5 are really the only ways to do it. g5, obviously not, not the ideal solution. So we see g6 instead. But now white has a number of winning moves, including the one played in the game, e6 just getting rid of this defender of g6, and there's not much to be done. Knight f6 was played, we take, h we take f7, this king comes to h7, trying to defend, after knight takes f6, knight takes f6, uh, white is, is simply, or queen takes f6 rather, white is, is simply winning. White reroutes this rook via a3, over to f3, and after queen f2, offering a trade of queens, now that white is up this very powerful f pawn. We see queen e5 check, king h1, another check, king back to h2, and after a repetition, white chooses g3 to defend her king. King g7 is played, and now queen d2, uh, rerouting the queen once again. Black can do nothing better than to pass. We see rook f2, and rook e2, and now rook e1. Black's, or white's being pretty mean here, just kicking the, the black queen around. And now that the queen has left this diagonal, queen b2 check spells disaster after rook e8. When there are threats of checkmate, threats of queening, and there's nothing, nothing left to be done for black to try to save this game. So it was a very interesting game this time around between uh, Kuneru and Nana. And like I said, they will be facing each other here in the Cairns Cup. So we'll see uh, how that matchup uh, actually shakes out in classical chess. Uh, we've seen uh, Kuneru uh, prevail in the rapid chess with this spatial advantage and Nana actually missing an opportunity to get back into the game. Uh, with all that in mind, thank you so much for joining me again for Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby and I will see you in the next episode.